all right so just so this is our company go see it's me and run we are both in this video conference here and this is what our company does we have both quite long experience in agile in software business and in different kind of industries and we are one of the few less coaching companies that exist there and run is a trainer i'm usually doing long-term consultation with organizations all right then to the topic so let's start from a thing called bureaucracy so if we have a large organization that has been evolving for some time there is some bureaucracy and people are using this word intuitively and we will let's see what it means so this is collected from a book a recent book by gary hamel he's asking do you have a bureaucracy in your organization and this is his list i won't read it through you can just read it yourself and think if you have seen this in some organization maybe not your organization no of course not your organization but the neighboring organization might have this so probably you have seen this kind of large organization and then another perspective how, well, how you can see if you have bureaucracy so typically bureaucracy is coming from split responsibilities others promise others deliver others plan others execute others know others decide others implement others test and so on and then this is also visible in in different roles and responsibilities in organization always when i hear roles and responsibilities i say hmm, okay yes we are here so you have different i mean obvious roles but then whenever we have a problem we are just nominating a new manager to solve that problem and then we have huge amount of managers and when we don't have any more people to manage narrow small problems then we are giving hats to people so this is how you can see okay yes we have bureaucracy and just count the number of these roles and you can kind of measure your how deep you are in this bureaucracy <laughs> all right so but now that was some kind of superficial intuitive view to the bureaucracy but this guy has actually been doing research about the control mechanisms in organizations and we have a thorough explanation in this blog that you can see there and so this guy he went into different organization and had one question in mind what are the control mechanisms how how do, how is organization controlling what the members are doing and he found three different mechanisms which he called market system which is that you measure input and output you can make a deal okay for example i give you money and you give me features i'm giving you money and you give me product and between companies and inside company and so on anyway it's it's a deal and if there's a deal and the other party doesn't deliver then you break the deal and people in this market system they are clueless okay what's going on i mean how can i work here how, how does the system work if, if you don't keep the your part of the deal so they are lost and then in the other kind of end of the organization there's what he called clan system we could call this also teamwork so it means that there's a group of people who work using informal value-based rules so maybe even unspoken rules that allow innovation collaboration and solving new problems that were unknown before so this is the only control mechanism that works for unique interdependent or ambiguous work like software development product development organizational development and then we have bureaucratic system it means that we have written rules and processes <clears throat> maybe not always written but exactly agreed okay it goes like this and this and this for example employment agreement and supervision 
roles and responsibilities in the organization, and so on. So in a way, I sometimes say that uh, <clears throat> process replaces competence. So <laughs> bureaucracy attempts to re uh, kind of, when we don't have competence, we don't know how they try to replace that by rules and processes. Typically, okay, yes, then, and Ochi has a wonderful uh, kind of uh, parallel. He says that market system and clan system, they are like uh, salmon and trout. They require oxygen and clear water to survive. Bureaucracy is like a catfish. It's surviving in mud. So always when there's a problem, bureaucracy survives and these other systems, they kind of lose. So then we have this, our big organization that has been growing bureaucracy. So in the top, we have this uh, business management, top management, who is working with economical reality. And then we have the front-end workers, teams, software developers who work with technical reality and the middle management, experts, architects and so on, who work with internal reality. So <coughs> this middle management, bureaucrats, <coughs> they analyze, coordinate, intermediate, execute, supervise, control and so on. And the top management, they have reward power. They have money. They can decide, okay, we give money there and there we are killing this product and so on. And the experts, the teams, they have uh, expert power. They are kind of controlling their finger movements on the keyboard. <laughs> so they have that kind of um, power. And the middle management, they don't actually have that kind of power. They are dependent from each other and for that reason they agree, they have agreements and politics and they make yet another rule and uh, agreement and, and, and process about how we work. And now <clears throat> what we would like to have in the organization is that the, the market control, that the top management really has some power to decide things and the organization is able to keep the deal. The business would go much better this way. And the front-end workers, the teams, that they are able to use more of their creative power in, in kind of creating what needs to be done. So we would like to minimize the bureaucracy. All right, so now let's see another example or explain actually how this bureaucracy is growing. Some of you might have seen this earlier, but anyway, we just to have everyone on the same uh, kind of level. Let's... Is your organization stuck? You have many parallel um, projects ongoing, but nothing moves. Everyone is waiting for information, resources, or decisions. You spend your time in endless meetings, planning, and rework. You are experiencing coordination chaos. But how did you get there? Here we have Dan. He's heading a fast-growing software-based business. The company is growing using common sense. Everyone focuses on their specialty because that's what they were hired to do. And it seems efficient. Talented, enthusiastic people just make it work. The success is based on the informal communication network. Specialization works, and it becomes the unquestioned norm. So whenever there is a problem, a new kind of specialist is hired or nominated. The number of specialists keeps increasing, and the complexity grows. In order to get things done, the company now hires a coordination specialist. Nina is the project manager. The business grows. More customers, more products, more specialists, more coordinators. The project managers, now headed by Nina, somehow pull it together. They become the heroes who squeeze value out of the messy organization. But the more the organization grows, the more chaotic it gets. Nina's project managers use the best processes and tools, but are not able to create results like before. The key people are torn between several projects. 
They are working days, nights, weekends, and holidays. They are burning out. Meanwhile, some other specialists are idling because their specialty is not needed at the moment. Experienced people start to leave. The organization has become too complex to be coordinated. The top management sits down to figure it out. Resources are not optimally allocated. The people should focus more on the projects and less on other stuff. We have to tighten the ship, clarify the roles and responsibilities, define detailed processes, measure and reward individual performance. This is what management consultants advise. Unfortunately, the management action breaks the informal knowledge sharing network and things get even messier. More control and more bureaucrats, but less outcome. The company becomes slow and expensive compared to emerging rivals. The top management tries to find another solution. We still have a strong customer base, but the new competitors eat our profit margin. People are not productive and projects have become slow. We have tried everything, but we are powerless in improving the situation. Let's outsource the problem to a contractor specialized in providing resources. We can then control the contractor by commercial agreements. Nina has studied some lean and agile. She disagrees with the management plan. Dan sees the challenges with outsourcing. The problem is not about people. It is the system. Outsourcing the leadership problem would complicate things even more. But just using lean and agile best practices to improve the coordination does not solve the root cause, which is the over-specialization of the people and fragmentation of the organization. Dan sees the light. We need to think completely differently. The problem is our old thinking, where others think and others do. Others decide and others coordinate. Some companies have taken another path. They trust in customer-oriented learning and cross-functional teams. Project managers are not coordinating plans and resources. The business decision-making is fast and close to the teams. This is possible for large corporations when the top management makes the suitable organizational design and truly supports the learning. There will be discovery, innovation, and business agility. It is motivating and builds a workplace where people stay and grow. Food for Thought was provided by GoSee. More deep. All right. So let's go back to the presentation. <clears throat> All right. So then let's make a drawing out of how this bureaucratic organization. So we have top management and then we have middle managers, typically line and program. And as we saw earlier, there are some other kind of middle, organize, middle management organization being there. And what is the problem with the different layers here is that for the frontline workers, the work doesn't work. And the key thing is that there's enormous mass of local detail. I mean, if you think about customer tailored software for a few dozen customers, the amount of detail, you just cannot throw it away because you would throw the business away. And in the middle, we have this fragmented siloed organization, the middle management, they have the knowledge how the system actually works now. It's slow, it's inefficient, but it works. If we would just take the middle layers away, it wouldn't work no more. It would be die, dead, <laughs> right away. So the amount of local detail is the key thing. That is the logistical thing that is keeping us in this old structure. And the top management, they are managing big problems. There are small escalations to middle management and huge escalations to top management, like customers complaining that, well, your telecom box doesn't start up, <laughs> for example, and so on. Okay, so that was our problem statement. <clears throat> now, if we think, we, when we try to change it, of course, we first try to change it according to the culture. So we ask from someone, okay, please make a blueprint. Make, we are asking it either from big consulting or some internal party. It could be some internal ivory tower or internal agile guru or whatever. And then there's a blueprint and then we have specialized coaches who are going and changing them. Now 
we have actually created yet another silo. So we have added coordination chaos. And maybe some local success, but overall system doesn't improve frustration. And actually the, about this delegating to management consultants. John Cotter is a, a leading figure in, in uh, management thinking, management consulting and so on. And he is plainly saying very kind of clearly in this interview that don't delegate your transformation to management consulting companies. You can read it carefully later in, in, uh, in the slides. And I'll just recite you a case that I have been witnessing. So 28-year-old 20 senior consultants come into our organization and they observe the pilots in our organization. But our organization is actually struggling. So the pilots are not necessarily kind of top quality. They are just experiments. Anyway, these consultants might not have the background to understand what is really going on. So they are just observing and picking best practices and then selling these best practices to the top management, creating a new organizational design and collecting those best practices into a cookbook. If you think carefully, this is planned to fail. And I have seen this happening and giving big money to this consulting company in case. So a more <coughs> generic, so typically happens that first companies try agile tools like rows and rituals, just take Scrum and put it everywhere. Then they do a bit more thinking, but still they try to just implement the process. It might work in some industrial process that is kind of planable, but thinking of software development and change, bigger transformation, it's not working. But what works is that we have continuous improvement where people who own their own work, they are making the improvements the people who own the huge mass of local detail come together think how are we able to change the system so that we don't lose all this detail we don't lose all this information and knowledge that we have here so the solution what we need is that we have a path a way to a solution that is solving the problem of all these different three levels. So the business, the sort of executives, they, they can trust that, okay, when we decide things happen, the system that works and the teams are able actually, actually to produce something. This middle one works as a system. Usually middle managers, they are resisting change because they are afraid that the system will break. It's not about their personal greed or <coughs> personal kind of uh, yeah, greed. It's usually that they are afraid that the system breaks and the company dies. So, And these three levels, it's not just our <coughs> imagination. It's coming from a really respected source of selling new systems to big companies. So all th three layers need to get their problem solved. And how, you, how do you then, then do this continuous improvement? You need to have the wisdom and power in the same room. If your organization is fragmented, then if, you are talk, if the decision makers talk with one silo, it's only half wisdom. So it's very difficult to get the wisdom and power in the same room. But anyway, this is what you need for improvement. And you get input from retrospectives, complaints, research, analysis, whatever. And it's important to differentiate between what is the biggest pain. It's the problem that we want to get rid of and then countermeasures or actions. Quite often, I see some superficial improvement where, okay, we, this is painful, so let's solve that pain. 
and then you are just giving that pain to some person who is trying to solve it and then no usually the systemic wicked pain is difficult to solve it, it, it could take years and several different kind of countermeasures and actions because before we are able to get rid of, of some big, big pain and in order to understand what is optimal what we actually can do we need to do very careful analysis a good starting point is a3 it's an industry standard especially in manufacturing industry it is a bit it's not a perfect fit for a chaotic complex organization that is really fragmented that is changing all the time like typically this fast growing software companies are so you that that is a starting point and there's a lot of ideas and things what you can take from a3 but it's not kind of uh, <coughs> a perfect thing and then a lot of things goes to archive if something is really important really painful it will come up again there's no no need to to kind of <coughs> No worry that we would be losing pain accidentally. That's not really a risk, unfortunately. <laughs> and of course, we have tried it many times. And the problem is, where can we find the people who are able to do this? And the solution is the, is the coaching community. In some companies, if we start from uh, continuous improvement we could call it improvement community anyway the the pattern and the people are the same so we have this company that has all these silos i have just make it, made a search surgery operation and moved created some space here in the middle so we here we have a cross role cross organizational community coaching community a network that enables that we the the wisdom and power can meet they can be in the same room they they make an analysis of the whole thing kind of crystallizing the wisdom so that it is understandable and you can that it, it actually can fit in the same room all the, the, the amount of all the details is not fitting the same room. Someone needs to do really careful and deep thinking, understanding how the system works. And then that's the vista. And then we have executives there who decide where we invest time and money, who, who can actually use the reward power and kind of give resources to things. So people of, from all walks of the organization who are able to contribute and participate here are coming together and they are thinking how is our system actually working they are creating knowledge about our system so the learning here is not learning something that is coming from outside it's creating knowledge about how we work however it's not <clears throat> easy it needs some support and experience to to make it happen it can start small and from small success from small experiments it gains some momentum and then management becomes interested and things start to roll and a key thing in our experience is that if if this cross role cross organizational coaching network is able to make better analysis about our organization than anyone else it becomes indispensable then the management says wow that's cool we want more please give us better analysis give us more understanding about the organization so that we can make wise decisions and then okay we need to change the organization and now what happens is that luckily because these people they 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 have come from all around the organization when they go back they understand this is how our system works this is why it works this is what doesn't work and they can distribute that knowledge for their 
kind of silo <laughs> for their specialty, for, for their local team, for their sub product or product area, whatever. So then people who have been learning in this cross role, cross organizational network, they go back to their place and they are actually this competent coaching capacity. So we don't have any external over specialized coaches who would come from outside and change people. And this is so then we have continuous improvement at two levels. We have it here in the middle about the system. And then we have the improvement capacity, coaching capacity locally. Now, this is this is the key thing. And the rest will follow. <laughs> and now when we have this, of course, this will build our approach. It's no one external who is having the wisdom to say this is how we work. It's built by this community. This community will demonstrate and learn new kind of leadership culture. It will heavily depend on teamwork because you, you're just not, you are able to create this knowledge only by teamwork. It's extremely good talent management for, for leadership capacity. And by the way, by leadership, I mean how you talk to people. <laughs> it's not a power game. Uh, and most probably the system will improve and the organization will be better in business and so on. And just a view to the capacity. So we need about one or two percent full time internal, highly skilled coaches, internal or external, long term. And then minimum 10% of the population needs to have the basic tools how you work in this community. And in our experience, it's about four days coaching or four days training program. I will later come back how that could look like. And then in this community, when it is about 10% of the whole population of the organization, there's, of course, very small core team that is working very actively. Some people who contribute, they participate in workshops and they create this knowledge. There are some people who just participate in workshops and, well, ex <laughs> come, come and join. And some people who just follow, but they are positive. And what happens here now is that when we want to have a change in the organization, we have a friendly base of competent people who are able to explain in their local environment how things work, how we want this transformation to happen, and so on. So it's, um, and they, this, this local people, they have the credibility locally. So they are kind of, people around them are trusting them. So, <clears throat> That was the main pattern. And now I once more want to say that this better than ever analysis of how we really how we really work, the knowledge that we create about our organization, this is the key thing. If we are not able to provide that from the community, then the top management will ask someone else, which unfortunately is quite often a management consulting company who are doing superficial work and taking a lot of money from that. And then one point about, I'm, I'm talking about creating knowledge about how the organization works. One way uh, to explain how that is effective is that, for example, if everyone in the organization knows what the coordination chaos means, I mean, they, they know the mechanism and they it's they can just refer it to saying by saying coordinates and chaos then there's no way going back so this is how this creative knowledge and vocabulary works and in my experience it's crystallized in drawings so people can explain the mechanism they can make a small drawing and the other people say ah yes we understood that they are explaining it again and these pictures are then used as basis for for the kind of next <coughs> topic or they are 
or uh, next things are built on top of the previous things. And you can look for, for this knowledge and vocabulary from very different sources. For example, large-scale Scrum, less books, and the website, there's about 300 different experiments about organizations. So that is, that is kind of a dictionary for this vocabulary. Then different sources, organization calls by Edgar Schein, that's wonderful. Then looking the resources for teamwork, Hackman and Susan Whelan, and so on. I, this is just a random take where you can start to look for those things outside. And then in an example of vocabulary that you can create inside. This is just from my some of my latest uh, consultations. So how product development is happening? You have a dreaming process and then you have the actual development funnel. So dreaming, thinking, doing. And then you are using Agile, so you create it from a small working core and so on. And then you have people all around and people need to participate to all these processes. Dreaming, thinking, or all phases of this uh, development process. And now, in typical organizations, thinking is kind of uh, non existent, <laughs> or people are not thinking, they are arguing. And then the top management is just pushing things to doing, and it doesn't work. Anyway, just a very brief example of this is a drawing that you can make on one yellow sticker and you can then talk about, okay, how are we doing here? Is the explosion of detail somewhere and then we are just not able to control things and so on. A small note about learning. Now, if we have agreed about the biggest pain and we have agreed that we really want to understand how that happens, that's a business-related learning challenge. Suddenly, learning about our organization becomes business because it's extremely important. That is focusing the learning, and then the learning is not copying from what outsiders have learned. It's that we learn about our organization, we create knowledge, so it's kind of higher level of learning, and it's part of the real business different perspective. Then <coughs> coming to this, um, I promised to say about this four days training program that initiates people into this uh, uh, coaching community. So I recite this because it's a wonderful elevator sentence. The training program provides skills and experience of teamwork building personal investment into continuous improvement, unlike habitual workshops and meetings where busyness leads to superficial results. And a lot of happy faces. I hope the picture is demonstrating what happens when you bring people from all around of all walks of the organization into the same room and they are thinking together. And the content could be, for example, like this. So first day, how you work with individuals, uh, <coughs> leadership, as I said. Second day would be about organizations like, like culture, complexity, power, analysis about the organization, something that we have already learned about our organization. And day three, when the training group has actually experienced some teamwork, then we have, we are studying teamworks, how, how to create actually uh, well-performing teams. And again, different topics that we have already learned about our organization. Then day four, then we are going into specific topics and starting to create analysis of organization in this training group and making this A3 analysis and starting that and doing some homework and then presenting stuff to the sponsoring management. So this is one example based on several, let's say dozens of groups. 
Okay, next topic. Uh, scaling or the kind of capacity view to the organization. So we have this core team. It's a handful of people who are really learning and creating knowledge about the organization. Typically, the leaders of this community are their internal external pair. Then we have executives that are working that are working closely with this core team, so that we have this power and wisdom in the same room. And the executives, they commit. First of all, they are giving the assignment. They said, we want more. So they are actually challenging this network to say, OK, we are not going to make decisions based on some superficial, fluffy stuff. We want real things. So give us that. We are demanding the analysis. And they commit to understand the analysis. They don't do all the footwork go around the organization and do I mean, usually they don't have time to do that thing. In some organizations they do, and that's actually very cool. But usually the executives, they are so busy in, in managing the big fires that they don't have time for that, for that, but they learn what the core team has created. And then we have this coaching community that is the interface to the broad reality, and they drive the change locally. And then we have the big, the whole organization, the working community. And about 10 to 20 percent of population have been going through this initiating training. And then if this is about 300 people, this whole organization, then we would have 50 people in this coaching community and maybe six people in the core team. So these are the figures. And this pattern scales into some hundred of people, let's say 300. With 600, I would be uncomfortable, so it would maybe look a bit different. And then, yes, there's a healthy circulation. So some people work in the core team for half a year, then they go back to their work and someone else is coming there. And then if we have thousands of people, we have one company here in Finland, which is 6,000 people or 12,000, depending how you count. So how, how would they do it? We have top management and we have some relatively autonomous business units. There will be this always in, in big organizations. So there are business goals. There's a reason for these business units to be and they, they are kind of business responsible. This top management, they need their own core team that is collecting understanding from the organization. It needs to be cross-role, cross-organization, and it, it needs to have this good enough support and observe that these arrows are coming from these quite competent sources in these business units. So the quality of the conversation and knowledge creation is high here. So the core team is able to really tell to the top management how it is going in this very big system. Observe that this core team is not dictating processes or things to these business units. These business units, they have autonomous business responsibility over their own transformation. They are not just obeying what this uh, top management is saying. For example, it could be that the R&D department, the technology, they, they, have, they are making the first experiment. They are having less transformation in one of their areas with about 50 people, 70 people which is deep and narrow, we want to make sure that it succeeds and only then expand when we have experience. For operations, this lean services in quotations, anyway, the key thing, we, we probably don't want to have anything, anything scrum like there, but we want to have power and knowledge in the front line, not having the wise back office and stupid front end that is just kind of taking the beating from the customers. That's not so. A different thing in operations. And marketing and sales, I don't know, maybe something 
if there's digitalization going on, I don't know what it would be, but it will be found out by continuous improvement. So in huge organizations, you need to kind of find your ways. All right. Now, <clears throat> just to crystallize the takeaways, the root cause is over-specialization and fragmentation leading to increased bureaucracy. And what we want to have is ability to change, to adapt, to have more effective teamwork. For that, we need new structures and culture will follow the structures. You cannot change culture without changing structures. System creates behavior. And continuous improvement is how we can get there. And we need to have this deal with the coaching community and executive management. Sponsoring knowledge. That's the win-win uh, deal here. And greed to learn, to understand how we work, is the basis for creating good solutions. And for that we need this cross-role, cross-organizational network. In principle, everyone is invited to contribute. But because knowledge creation is challenging, we, we need to find the the <coughs> high talent people who are actually able to do that work. And this is not easy. If this would be taking a new tool, then it would be easy. We could use the very traditional change agent training, but this is actually learning to change our organization, learning to create knowledge about our organization. This is more challenging. So we need best external wisdom here. All right, now uh, I have some failure patterns. Um, maybe at this moment, if someone wants to ask something about what I have been speaking so far, so please, you're welcome. If there are any, any questions or comments. Excuse me, I have a question. Yes, please. I'm trying to reconcile the difference between consulting, which you seem to think is a, a problem, hiring outside consultants to come in and introduce processes that are going to work or ever be implemented, versus uh, sort of this meta coaching coaches or consulting mm. to create a community of coaches. So can you just uh, speak a couple words about that? Okay, I obviously not very clearly defined terminology here. Uh, so uh, in the early slides, I was uh, saying that a typical management consulting company approach is that they, they want to kind of make money from their previous experiences and credibility on that. So they, they are just, it's um, easiest for them to kind of reuse what they already have. So that's one approach of consulting. And then, uh, as you said, meta consulting. Well, it is consulting. So uh, a better approach for consulting is that you are having a more long term deal. You work with the top management and helping them to form formulate this uh, or form or build this coaching community so you are progressing in the speed of the organization building this coaching community and having then a more lasting effect so it's maybe a different way to consult was this helpful yes uh, quite clear because it's kind of like you're in there coaching the coaches for the future coaches and then i guess just then uh, the issue becomes when does grasshopper seize the pebble out of your hand and be left to then do this by themselves? Or is this an ongoing recurring role? Or are you attempting to duplicate what you can bring to the organization within that community of coaches in the organization? Well, <clears throat> um, I, I, I need to rephrase. <laughs> 
so to check that I understood. So you, I think you said two things. The first thing is that when is the consultant kind of letting go and the organization can do it things by themselves? Was that one thing that you were kind of mentioning? Mm -hmm. And then there was something else also. I think I basically said the the same thing in another way, or if it's an ongoing relationship. Mm, yes, uh, most probably there's intensive start, and then it is ongoing and maybe coming back at some other time. But in the the uh, <clears throat> let's say that it's uh, at some point this organization, the people inside the organization, they will become much more competent in solving their own problems than the external consultant that was originally helping them. So maybe at some later points they need some refreshing external view, maybe some checking and so on, so then they might invite some consultant back. And then a related thing is that, um, for example, I have been kind of <laughs> thinking organizations for, for 25 years, been di in different organizations. I just was showing that one example drawing the, the, the funnel. So an experienced consultant is able to introduce this vocabulary to the organization, has a library of things. Okay, maybe this would be a nice way to explain what is happening here. And the internal people say, oh, yes, exactly. Or they say, no, doesn't really fit. Let's try something else. So so they. this is one way how the consultant is in the beginning able to kind of also do uh, not only kind of meta consulting, but also participating in, in, in creating the knowledge. So this is actually something uh, I know this meta consulting is an dominant approach in organizational development and i think it falls short typically it's very useful if the consultant is able to actually understand what is going on in the organization just <laughs> one more kind of story many young consultants in this kind of management consulting companies they are saying that uh, well, load balancing is no problem in the organization. If you need more people in that area, just move them. Which means that they just have not experienced what software development is like. <laughs> it just doesn't, it's not that easy. So the consultants need to understand a bit about how the organizations work. All right, some other questions? Okay, I can just show something about these failure patterns. So this is a healthy role of the coach that we have the top management executive sponsor who is giving a new challenge to the team's organization. The team is saying help, help us. And the management is saying, okay, I have hired a coach, ask help. So this is the healthy picture. And if there's unhealthy things, it will happen like this. So the coaches are pushed to the coaching bubble. So if the sponsor is saying to the coaches, change them for us, then the teams, the organization will say, it may, okay, just fuck off. <laughs> we, we are not interested. Oh, you can hang around, but we don't care about you. Then the coaches are in this coaching bubble and it can be internal coaches or external coaches whoever can be this in this bubble i have been there <laughs> and then sometimes if we have this unhealthy figure sometimes the coaches they can find the ways to help teams locally so they are it's kind of the organization is a wild west the blueprint actually doesn't work and teams are doing whatever and the coach might be helping them locally. So I have also been in this role. <laughs> so the upper organization is lost and I'm just working with the teams and oh, okay, well, maybe this is a wise thing to do here. 
this is not good for the for the organization all right this was just some some failure patterns that i have seen i i think i already explained some bigger ones earlier okay how are we doing any some more questions we have five minutes time and um, if you are afraid of asking the question you can also post them to the chat oh yes and i'll actually stop okay i don't stop sharing if i need to go back to some slide If right. there are no questions no questions so <laughs> you are you, you you did it excellent job ari again <laughs> you so much i i was uh, yeah i, I wonder what this silence like. means hmm. <laughs> <laughs> people fell asleep maybe no, i heard somebody laughing sophia was laughing <laughs> Eva, I was laughing yeah that's true so i'm just trying to find the video so now i'm here no, it was quite interesting. Um, I'm just was thinking how to apply it really in the organization. So if you come to the point, you even have this improvement team. What are the next steps with the oh, um, yes. uh, problem solving? Um, that was my, my thoughts because uh, I'm really interested about that because I'm exactly on the point. Yes, very good question. Uh, so I have been able to... There, there are many ways how you can start it. So. First of all, this coaching community can start from anywhere. Typically at Nokia, it needed to start from the people who are doing the work. Maybe some quality manager, maybe some individual line manager, maybe some product owner or developer who starts this thing. And then it starts to roll. In Ericsson, Finnish Ericsson site at Kirkonomi, they had a very successful agile transformation where the management was driving it. So the management started to learn and they, they were driving this learning and they learned themselves because they, they had time for that. So that was very successful. And then if I am in the organization and I want to kind of somehow check if this starts to go on, I start with retrospectives. I would prefer many small retrospectives, maybe 30 people and having the sponsoring top manager in those retrospectives, hearing what is happening and kind of saying that we are serious and I'm just a participant here, but I want to hear what is happening. And then start first analysis experiments from those retrospectives and then coaching those A3 analysis experiments that are starting from, from the retros. And not all will survive. Usually it's something like one out of five is actually creating good results. Maybe, well, maybe one out of five, two out of five, something like that. And then I'm just hoping that some of those is so successful that it will lead into something. So that's how mm -hmm. you can try to start this as a consultant. And this was also okay. also uh, some expectation management for the management. So you, you need to say that it's difficult, it's hard work. This knowledge creation is hard work. You really need to invest in it. And then uh, that not everything will succeed. And also that when you have learned what is actually happening, then only then you get this kind of improvement actions and so on. So some, some uh, Expectation management is important. Mm. Are you also applying system modeling for that? System modeling is uh, one tool. It's a very good tool. If you if you like it, if it is fitting the situation, it's good. Mm -hmm. Then yeah, thank you. yeah. Typically, I yeah. like to draw more simple pictures. Systems modeling is for the workshop where the management themselves are thinking. Yeah, you're right. 
Yeah, good point. Thanks a lot. So we'll see. So maybe I come to you back, back to oh, you. Yes, you're welcome. always welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Nothing. All right, should we wrap it up then? Any final words, Ari, that will encourage us to transform the companies that we consult? Uh, I don't know if I have anything else to say. <laughs> I think I have spoken too much today already. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I mean, just um, go on in your own way. I hope you understood that the, the, the core pattern is really simple. Just try to do it in your own way. And all the lot of talking that I did today is some kind of uh, just um, additional detail. Okay. All right. Good. So thank you. Thank very you much. for your time.